to uh, another episode of the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine podcast. And we're actually here in, in um, Vienna and at the uh, European EANM 2017 meeting. And uh, it's a very exciting meeting. There's lots of good uh, things happening. And I've just seen a, a great talk um, on uh, one of the hot topics, one of the challenging areas, one of the areas where people challenge the difficulties, and that's with um, MR attenuation correction for for PET MR, and uh, um, if you could perhaps introduce yourself, well, I think one of the things you talked about, and this is particularly for brain, which is where um, perhaps one of the first areas where PET MR is going to actually get the attenuation correction probably right, or, or better at least. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit about what yourself, where you work, and, and where you're from. So I'm Ninon Burgo, so I did my PhD at uh, UCL, so in the Center for Medical Image Computing, so which is when I did most of the work on attenuation correction. And I'm now a postdoc in Paris in the PTS Salpetria Hospital in the Brain and Spine Institute. Okay, so um, let's, let's go back a bit to basics and talk about some of the challenges with, uh, with using MR for attenuation correction. Of course, in CT you've got something that uh, you can scale, the, the attenuation yeah. of a CT beam, you can scale up to a uh, PET transmission uh, because particularly PET where you've got a full line of flight through the through the body, you can fairly easily calculate a fairly accurate attenuation correction for an individual. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the basic methods used to look at attenuation correction for MR? Um, so probably like uh, the first methods uh, implementing like the scanners were relying on uh, segmenting the MR images. So for uh, like wall body, you uh, segment in usually like four classes: so background, um, soft tissue, um, fat, and lung. And for like brain, uh, we like the it started with so just like segmenting basically. Uh, the soft tissue, uh, background, and, and, and fat. Uh, the problem with this method is that it, you had like no bone class, so huge like underestimation of your uptake. And so the methods now they include uh, a bone class, so different like MR sequences are used where you can actually see a bit better like the bone, and so you can segment it a bit more easily. So that 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 uh, MR sequence that picks a bone that's called ZTE, is that right? Uh, so you have all like the short, ultra short, or zero uh, echo time family, and all these methods basically because uh, they start acquiring the, re the image uh, really like early, they still are able to capture a little bit of bone, okay. and so then you can use these images to segment uh, bone from the right. So you segment it based on the information that you get from the yeah. MR. Uh, what other way can you do it, or what other things can you add to that? Um, so, still on like the segmentation uh, yeah. methods. So, because even if you like include like a bone class, it's very important to adapt to each patient. And with like the first method, you weren't really doing that because you were just assigning so predefined attenuation coefficients to uh, the bone class. Uh, so, which is a problem because we know that bone density varies a lot uh, among like individuals. So now like methods uh, that rely, especially on the ZT and the UT sequences, um, are able to like convert the MR intensities to the CT Huntsville units. Ah, and right. so you're able to correct your PET data better and mainly like to adapt to each uh, individual. And this is important because the variation in bone attribute a lot of the attenuation in brain studies yes. rather than the soft tissue, is that correct? Yes, and especially, for example, when you uh, study like neurodegenerative diseases, well, you have people that are usually older, and ah. so here, like the bone density, especially, for example, on females, is really different from like what you get when you scan like 20-year-old people, so you really need to like adapt to have really uh, accurate uh, PET uptake. Right. The other thing you looked at was using atlases. How does that help? Um, so the atlas-based uh, methods, so as we say, rely on like an atlas or also called like a template, either like just one or several of them, so templates for like multiple subjects. And here the idea is to um, map basically these uh, atlases or templates to the subject's anatomy. Uh, to basically, so what happens usually, like in in like the, the template, is composed of an MR and a CT image, and so basically you use like the MR template 
uh, to register, uh, that is registered so to your uh, new patients. And then you can just apply some information to the CT. Ah. And so you can obtain a CT image that looks like the patients that you're uh, studying. So Providing the atlas matches your individual yeah. patient, right? So yeah, that's the limitation of like single atlas methods. So that's why it's better to use like multiple atlases because you have like simply like more chances to have from the beginning an, an anatomy that matches uh, the patient you're studying, and also you have more chances for like the registration to work because you do multiple of, I mean, many of them. So even if like a few like fail, then it's not a problem because it's compensated by the other. Right. So, so you looked at uh, you looked at FTG scans. You looked at yeah. um, uh, you looked at uh, amyloid studies with uh, flibetapir, right? Yes. And you also looked at uh, PIB. Yes. yes. So, so how did how did uh, how did the uh, CT based attenuation compare with the MR based attenuation for these subjects? Um, so this really depends on like the methods um, that you're like evaluating. Um, basically, when you for like the method that are implemented so currently like on, on, on scanners. So like this, when we um, studied this, it was a few years ago, so it was only done on the Siemens MMR. Uh, so the methods implementing on, on this scanner were not like performing like really well. You had uh, underestimation of like more than five or even sometimes like 10 persons. Right. Uh, but with like the methods uh, developed like more recently, you can get below the bar of the uh, five percent difference, and even with like the single multi atlas methods and also the segmentation methods that take into account like the bone density of like the individual, you can get really like even lower than like two percent difference. So here right. we get like pretty accurate results. Right, but that's important if you're trying to do a study for, for example, yeah. amyloid therapy, where you might be trying to stop amyloid accumulation with a base mm -hmm. inhibitor, you might only have one or two percent of the year. So you might only be looking at two or three dif yeah. percent difference in amyloid. So you need to do this very accurately. Yeah. So um, it isn't just the average though in terms of in terms no. of effectiveness. It's also the outliers. What were the outliers mm -hmm. in these? What percentage of patients would would not fit in say two or three percent? What? Um, not many. I don't have like the uh, the number of mine, but it's really like for a few. Uh, subjects that you really have like um, inaccuracies that are more than like two five percent, um, and this happens, for example, for like the atlas based methods, when you have like uh, individuals with unusual uh, bone density. Right. This because you just simply like don't, don't see it on like most of the. Uh, or they've got a MRI piece of missing bone or something along those lines. Yes. But it's at least like a missing bone. You can see it on right. the MRI image, not perfectly, but I mean, if you see it, you can, I mean, have in mind, oh, this is going to be a problem for the attenuation correction. And so I will keep like a closer look on it. But for like bone density, it's really difficult to say with, to, to see with like the, the sequences um, that are again implemented on scanner. If with like new sequences, it might be better. Um, but it's it's not that easy now, and like f for like the segmentation based methods, uh, the outliers um, are mainly due to um, miss segmentation in the areas where you have like uh, bone and bone and air or bone ah, and like, soft tissues, right. which are like more difficult to segment. So yeah, this right. are the two scenarios. So the take home measures would be to always do the subsequent scans on exactly the same scanner with exactly the same setting. That was far mm -hmm. more important with PET-MR than perhaps even mm -hmm. with PET-CT. And I think perhaps another take home measure was look at your, yes. uh, your scan for artifacts straight yeah. away. Um, and examine the the, 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 the yeah, false yes. mu map, if you like, yeah. uh, very for, for any artifacts and correct that straight away. Would that be a fair, fair comment? Um, yes, this is really like uh, important. Really, when you look at the pet image, have like the uh, attenuation map like next to it because uh, you will like be able to see if I mean what you observe something a bit weird on your pet image is due to the attenuation correction. Right. Or not. So this is really important. Well, that's important for visual interpretation, but what about for quantitative so, interpretation? So here it's a, like a, a a bit more difficult, and that's I think why it's. Um, it's interesting to like combine uh, combine uh, different like types of approaches uh, because, for example, like atlases could like help like segmentation-based methods uh, in the uh, 
cases where you have like artifacts, things like that, because Atlas based method would be like uh, less sensitive to this type of errors. And on the other hand, um, segmentation methods can help the Atlas based methods um, in adapting to the individual. So I think, I mean, to me, that's the way uh, to go forward to really like combine different types of approaches to really like uh, get the best out right. of the two. And one approach that, that uh, was segmented Cork was using some of the time of flight information to get yes. a mission and add that into the mix as well. I mean, that looked pretty noisy to me, but it, maybe it helped in some ways. Yeah, I know. It's, it's um, because the advantage of the, what we call like the emission-based method is that we rely a bit uh, less on the, so MR uh, data. That's and right. so if these like MR images are corrupted by artifacts, then emission-based methods would be really like less sensitive to that and so give gotcha. like better results. But it's still like, uh, I think, a lot of work to have them really implemented. But with no like better like uh, computing resources and simply like knowledge, I think this is also uh, a, a really like promising uh, Right. So, so do you think we're already at the stage now where you can say for visual interpretation it's okay to use MR attenuation correction? Is it ready? You'd say yes to that? Um, uh, yes. Uh, but again, like, when you but, look at the PET, look at the attenuation map. That's, I think, um, the way to go forward. But, but uh, If it's bad, do you think it's worthwhile then giving the patient a CT and then doing fusion and then doing attenuation correction that way? Um, I think that would be like the really like last uh, thing to do. Um, but maybe what could could be done is like um, have a maybe fast and easy way to f correct for attenuation for like a first um, look. And then if you see that uh, the method didn't perform well, then maybe offline you can have like methods that perform a bit better, ah, okay. maybe that take a bit more time to compute, but I mean, maybe it's worth taking that time. So that's, I mean, I would, I would first try like an other MR based method before going to the, to the CT, but yes, there's always like this, the, the CT if necessary. Right. Okay. Um, uh, but you think we're there, we think we're, we're progressing. What about for quantitative measurement of amyloid for longitudinal studies? Do you think we're there for the, now? Uh, but that's difficult. I think it would be like um, with like the new um, the new methods, for example, the multi atlas methods or the segmentation based method, taking into account uh, uh, subject specific bone density. I, f I think we can trust this kind of, of of methods. But again, for like the patients having a usual anatomy, um, if like. The individual has unusual like bone density. I think it's going to be like difficult to really trust uh, right. the results. Okay, so so it'd be useful to know whether a patient had a, had low bone yes. density, or if, even if they had a bone density study before mm. they had a PMR, <laughs> to see whether they're going to be good candidates for use of the PMR. Yeah, maybe, or just like simply rely on like the new like MR sequences that allow you to, um, for example, like the zero echo time sequences but allow you to know a bit more about the bone density. I think that's, uh, that would be a way to go. Oh, excellent, excellent. So where can people find out a bit more about what you're doing and, and about this topic? Um, <laughs> well, you can uh, look. Uh, actually, if you want to try like, the methods that I developed during my PhD, it's available online. Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's called like, Nifty Web. Ah, oh, gotcha, yeah, um, so, I know Nifty Web, yes. So you can uh, simply, like, basically uh, upload an MR image. We uh, do uh, the computation on our site, and we send you back Pseudocity by email. So that's actually how you can, like, um, try, ah. try the methods. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, because we can't share, like, the MR City database, so instead we keep it, and but we provide, like, a web service for people to use the methods. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. That's very useful. Thank you for <laughs> taking the time and I really appreciate um, helping us out with the podcast. Thank you. Thank you.